So I want to start the talk right away with um, an infinite Monte Carlo Ethereum. So what if I told you uh, there is a contract on Ethereum that actually lets you deposit Ether in it, and later on you can actually withdraw uh, whatever you deposited. Sometimes you can withdraw more. Sometimes you can withdraw only less. But at no point um, in, its, in its lifetime will the balance of this contract ever go down. Would you believe me? Um, how many people think that this is impossible? Raise your hands. Seems like a lot of people think that. Um, but turns out, uh, would you believe me more if I told you there is $50 billion in this contract right now? Um, it has eight leading zeros. And if you look at the, um, the contract on Etherscan and see how it was deployed, it was uh, deployed using a Tornado Cash uh, funded wallet. And the person who wrote this contract is uh, sitting here right now with us. Um, anyone, any guesses what is this contract? Yes, it is the Ethereum beacon chain contract. So what is going on here? So if, you, if I look at, into the, the Ether scan chart for um, the balance and ETH um, of this contract, it only ever goes up. It never went down, even though you can actually withdraw from this. Um, here's a different chart, um, this time from uh, Nansen AI. Um, you can see that the balance actually goes down at some point um, uh, around, around April, where the withdrawals was enabled um, in the beacon chain. So again, what is going on here? Um, so the withdrawals are actually processed on the, the beacon chain um, rather than on the you know, uh, proof of work chain, word, sorry, rather than on the execution chain uh, from the contract. Um, and the beacon chain simply just like gives you the ETH without really like changing the balance of this contract. And this contract only stays as this like black hole which lets you like deposit ETH and run a validator. Um, and you know, nothing else really happens. So here is like an infinite money glitch. Um, you, you deposit 32 ETH into this contract, you run a validator for however long you want to, and then you withdraw 32 ETH. And all of a sudden you just um, increase the balance of the deposit contract by 32 ETH without really like, uh, you know, with, without, out of nowhere. I don't know how to profit from this, but yeah, there you go. So what, why is this a big deal? Um, it's interesting because calculating the total supply of ETH is a very difficult problem. Um, in case of Bitcoin, there's a very nice way to show that it can only be at most 21 million. Um, but with Ethereum, it's not that easy. Um, there are contracts like, uh, there are accounts like 0x dead, 0x0, uh, which people use for burning ETH. Would you actually consider uh, the ETH in these accounts to be part of um, the chain? If you, if you think about it from the protocol point of view, you actually have to consider this to be part of, you know, uh, part of ETH in the chain. Um, nothing is like truly burned if you just uh, send something into like Sorex debt. Um, so if you try to compute the total amount of ETH in, in uh, Ethereum protocol, so what you can do is uh, at the beginning, you can look at how much ETH was at the genesis, and then you can look at uh, how much ETH was generated uh, on minor rewards. Um, the EIP-1459 actually introduced a way to like properly burn ETH um, for the first time in the protocol. Um, this was ETH that, you know, unlike sending into like a wallet, uh, like 0x0 or 0x dead, you, this is actually removed from the protocol. Uh, this is ETH that, that you spend on the base fee. Uh, but then there was the beacon chain as well, which introduced like more emissions um, to the validators um, and also like slashing. Turns out, and, and there was the merge, which actually uh, merged the proof of work chain and the, the beacon chain. Um, and this introduced this exception that the balance of the deposit contract only ever goes up. You can never like make it go down. So you can't really like look at every single account on Ethereum and just like add up the balances because then you're double counting this uh, 
um, uh, uh, the E that you withdraw from the beacon chain. Um, beacon chain. So the moral of the story is tracking the supply of ETH is pretty hard. You have to work around a lot of these exceptions. Um, so yeah. So what is this talk about? Um, I want to talk about a lot of uh, quirks in the EVM. I want to talk about some of um, the design mistakes. I mean, these, these are subjective things. And some of the history behind it. Um, there is often a, a real reason where somebody thought some design was good at some point and then later figure out maybe it's not so good anymore. I want to start with return data copy. It's a very important instruction in the EVM. Um, this is what enables uh, proper dynamic data types in, in Solidity. Uh, without this, there is no um, dynamic data types. Um, very, very underrated instruction. So let's think about what happens when there is an out of bounds access in, in EVM in general. If you look at memory, um, if you read from an offset that's uh, beyond whatever is the current allocated memory, which is, you know, M size, you actually get zero. Um, an, out, an out of bounds access in memory gives, works as if, you know, there was nothing. If you look at call data, you know, you can do a call data copy of a region that's uh, out of bounds for call data, and it assumes as if there was nothing over there. You would get values, I mean, you would get zeros. The same with call data load. If you read a call data load from something about call data size, you get zero. However, with return data copy, it's different. If you actually try to read return data uh, that's uh, beyond your bounds, you actually get a reward. Um, how did we get here? So it turns out when the instruction was proposed in, in EIP 211, the original proposal actually wanted to keep the semantics to be the same as any other instruction um, in EVM. That is, if there is an out of bounds access, you treat it as if uh, you were reading from zero. However, there was a suggestion by Nick Johnson from ENS, and he basically suggested, oh, this should never happen. I mean, reading from out of bounds should be a reward anyway. Why don't we just uh, reward? And this was in, in turn implemented in the EIP. Um, so the EIP was implemented mainly because of the suggestion, and, and let's see what happened um, because of this. Um, turns out this was a cause of a bug in, in the, in the SOLC compiler. Um, I will try to explain what happened. Um, so SOLC has an optimization step which allows you to remove um, unnecessary writes to memory. So if you can figure out that there was a write to memory and you never read from this memory location, you actually can remove this um, write because uh, you can say yes. Um, but it's not that easy anymore with return data copy. You also have to check if the if there was an out of bounds access, and uh, any other instruction doesn't have to like you don't have to do, the, do this check for any other instructions. And uh, Salty at some point did not do this check, and there was this uh, optimizer bug where you can remove you, uh, the compiler can remove a return data copy, even though it might actually reward. Of course, this um, case is like very hard to happen in real life, because in most cases, the value of size here would be returned at a size so where um, a reward is, ac is actually impossible. Uh, but I just wanted to give an, one example of a bug caused by this exceptional behavior. And if you look at Go Ethereum as well, um, curiously enough, the return data copy and the return data buffer is actually involved in a lot of EVM bugs over there. It's not really because of um, this exceptional case, um, but still, it's very curious how this one instruction is the cause of a lot of uh, bugs across the ecosystem. The other thing I wanted to talk about is about transient storage. So transient storage is an EIP that's you know, currently in progress, may, be uh, may, may actually happen in the next hard fork. But I just wanted to like talk about some curious like edge cases here. Um, so transient storage in short is it's like storage, but only lasts across uh, a transaction. So before the transaction starts, it's going to be all zeros. And at the end of the transaction, we just zero it 
any, um, we are going to like zero it anyway, like throw it off. Um, one common use case for this is uh, reentrancy logs. Um, let's talk about let's talk about how reentrancy logs are implemented today. Um, so most of the time, you just uh, keep a variable in storage. Um, you know, let's say a boolean called lock. And at the beginning of a call, you can just assign this lock to be true, uh, which means we actually lock it. And at the end of the call, you can uh, just unlock it. And before anything happens, you can just say, you can just check if it's already locked. And if it's, if it's already locked, you just remove it. And this actually prevents uh, any, any reentrancy. But this is actually not how it's implemented because of, you know, gas. Um, so instead of going from like zero to one to zero, you actually go from one to two to one, uh, and one, one being like the, the lock, uh, sorry, the unlock state. And um, when, you, when you initialize, when you deploy the contract, you start by initializing this variable to one. This is because of like some um, changes in like some issues with the gas refunds that make the second one uh, more, uh, more optimal. Um, in, in practical cases. But there is one, um, one foot gun here, which is if you actually forget to unlock, you have a contract that's now in deadlock. Um, you, can, you cannot use the contract anymore. Your contract is stuck. So how does uh, transient store uh, help here? So you can actually implement the same thing, but with transient, um, using trans transient storage. You can just set this lock to true at the beginning to indicate a lock position, and you can set it to false at the end of the call to unlock it. Um, the same check as before. Everything is the same, except that you work with transient storage. However, there is one peculiar case here, which is if you actually forget to unlock, there is actually no deadlocks anymore. So is this actually safer? Uh, because you know, there is no room for deadlocks anymore. Let, let's think about it. Um, which brings you to the question, um, if you don't even have to lock, why, why do we have to waste 100 gas to actually do the unlock, right? Th this brings us to like, the question about safety versus chaos. Um, there are a lot of users, uh, probably sitting here right now, who skip payable in functions to save like 10 to 20 gas. Um, these users may be tempted to actually like skip the unlock. So what does this cost? You can actually save 100 gas by you know, saving the unlock. However, this actually creates a, what could be called as a transitory deadlock, where if you try to use the, same, the, the contract again in the same transaction, uh, you, you actually have a deadlock. You, know, you can't use the same, I mean, you, you get a reward. Um, and this transient storage basically introduced this, you know, very intra-transaction state, and you know that probably like breaks some some sort of like mental models for you know both developers and you know everyone sitting here. Um, so, what is a better design for transient storage? You know that can like fix this problem. So, one way to like fix this is you know instead of thinking about transient storage at a transactional level. Think about it at a call call uh, level. So at the beginning of a call, you have a fresh set of transient storage, and at the end of the call, everything gets cleared. And in my opinion, it's a better design because you you actually don't have to unlock by design. It's a, it's a way cleaner way to think about um, this. Um, and a lot of the invariants you think about can remain as is. There is like no notion of intra-transaction, um, you know, deadlocks. Um, yeah, that's it about uh, transient storage. And uh, I want to do one last thing, which is like a pet peeve of mine. Um, if you do any like EVM tooling, this is like one thing that has probably like bit you uh, at some point. Um, it's, about the, it's about the order of operations and shifts. So almost every operations have a pretty common order, which is, you know, if you look at division of x, y, it's x divided by y. However, if you look into shifts, um, they actually have the opposite order. Um, if you do a shift of x, y, you actually are doing you know, y shifted by x. Why is that? This, is actually, this was actually designed to save gas. Um, how, does it, how does it actually save gas? 
let's let's look into it. So in solidity, when you write an expression like you know f divided by g, um, most of the time, what people expect is to evaluate it from left to right. Um, I'm talking about the side effects of the function, not really like the operator precedence. That's you now, of course, would be um, would be valid as in like any other other language. But the the side effects, you know, f and g can have side effects. Most people expect it to f to happen before g. However, if you actually implement it this way, it's actually less efficient because you need an extra swap instruction to put the arguments in the correct place in the stack for the division operation. So shifts were actually designed to prevent this. You know, the, the, well, if we had to re redesign EVM all again, you, you probably can like, you know, shift, like swap the um, order of every single instruction, but you know, shifts was particularly designed to prevent this you know, one, one issue. Um, this is like the only instruction with this you know, opposite order. Um, and if you have like built some kind of tooling, this is something that you have encountered in the past. You, know, you have spent like hours trying to debug something only to re realize that the order of operations were, were the opposite. This is one other quirk. Um, so what do, you, what do we like take away from all these things? Um, Designing the EVM is very hard. There are so many different users. That, you know, there are people who build the compilers, people who build tooling, people who build uh, VMs like GoEthereum and you know, other clients, people who build uh, uh, tooling like Foundry, uh, people who write code, people who want to optimize code, people who want to like, optimize for safety. So having something designed for all of these people is very hard. Um, yeah, just think about it much more deeply before when you see a new proposal. That's, that's my only takeaway from this. Thank, thanks so much. Thanks so much. I was deeply crying when you talk about this shift left. I remember my hours of misunderstanding why. Thanks. Uh, so great, great and inspirable talking about EVM. We go into the roots of blockchain, and I believe there are a lot of questions here to our uh, great presenter. So guys, hands up. There. If you're doing that stack-based system for the T-stores and stuff, when it unwinds back up, what if the lower level has set the same storage slot? What happens? I have to check the IP. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah, but it's, it's one more announcement. Okay, one more question here. Uh, just a, a note if you self destruct and send to yourself, you can burn Ethereum. So maybe they should implement it there. <laughs> Yeah, but it's still kind of, is it really burned from the protocol? Is it? Hmm, I see. Yeah, another, another edge case, yeah. I see. Any questions? So uh, I, I guess as we go further into the blockchain world, right, do you think uh, EVM will take uh, inspirations from something like introducing a heap and like uh, like ASLR or like you know more security uh, into like the VM design like how in the traditional world VMs have these so what are your thoughts yeah, it's a good question I, I think one of the challenges is the contract size so that really limits like the design a lot you can't you know you want you still have to compile things down to like 24 kilobytes so you, you can't have too much, uh, too, too much on the EVM. It still has to be somewhat small. Maybe if we can restrict like some of the contract size issues, um, you could you know, have complex constructs. But yeah, without that, I think very complex constructs that require a lot of bytecode may not be like a good idea. Yeah, because then you have to think about the performance of the nodes. You know, there are some People expect every transaction to be executed in like a certain amount of like milliseconds, and if you if you don't have this invariant, then you know you you either need like more, 
you, you either need to like increase the um, you know, compute requirements for a node, uh, which is very low right now for Ethereum. Um, other, other blockchains don't have this. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. You know, EVM was sort of designed so that any, anyone can run a node. Um, so this invariant may be like, may not actually hold true with more complex things, you know, bigger by code sizes and all. Yeah, perhaps. One more question there. Yeah. So about the out of order, you know, out of bound read, right? I agree that it's bad to have inconsistent, you know, in the standard. But what to do, right? Uh, you know, if we suppose we are allowed to design another version, do you think we should just maybe make it first, make it consistent? Second, should we just make it as exception? I, I don't feel like read out of bound that give you a zero. It's it's a it's a nice solution, but you know, really like two question: what should we do, and what will be the option? Yeah, I think consistency is very important. Um, so if you're designing things from scratch, like keeping it consistent is very important. Like either either way, um, but I personally like the non-rewarding case. Um, I think it's easier to analyze uh, opcodes if they don't have a lot of side effects, and uh, yeah, that's what I think. Okay, thank you guys, thank you Harry, applause man, to really great report about AVM.